I'm the head of logistics for Nando's EMEA, as we call it, which is India, Middle East, and Africa. So I look after South Africa from a pure, full logistics um, perspective, and then the other countries in terms of making sure that they have what they need to trade. No in-market logistics. So what we're going to talk about today is, the, I'll be honest, the, the title is a little bit misleading, and I'll tell you why. but trying to make the right balance or trade-off between sort of profit and planet, or more, more succinctly how you try and, and, and balance some of the greener uh, issues that we're faced with, with what you need to do in your supply chain. So just a little bit about Nando's, hopefully all of you know who Nando's is, those of you in the audience that are South African. Uh, but we, we actually turned 30 this year, so we've been in operation since 1987. We operate in 23 countries around the world with about one and a half thousand restaurants. So we've expanded quite nicely across the, the globe in quite a short space of time, in my opinion. Uh, you can see just some of our recent designs. But we've tried to move as a brand away from being seen as a takeout place, like they, we typically are in South Africa, to more of a sit-down uh, experience. And our design has sort of followed that through over the last sort of 10 or 20 years. We've been quite active in social media and we've been quite active with our advertising. The first thing that anyone asks me or tells me when I say I'm from Nando is, oh, the guys who make all those funny adverts. Right? It's what you hear all the time. I'm not going to play any of them for you. One, because we only have half an hour. And two, because you're actually here to, to hear about the supply chain. But just some of the stuff we've done recently, we've taken uh, fun, of certain things that have been that have happened in the political spectrum so we don't take sides we don't pick a party what we do is we comment on relevant issues that happen in south africa so we've made fun of parliament we've made fun of the president we've had quite a lot to say about what's happened at treasury um, and we also try when it's possible to to support what we see as good things so uh, we have quite a lot of good things to say in the media about tuli manuzela I don't know if you've seen the latest one around Brian Malefe, but it's out there. Uh, I found it quite entertaining. So we try and take a stand, we try and, and, and be relevant socially uh, in the country. Not trying to say too much about Nando's, but then why are we here today? So what we're here today to talk about is the fresh supply chain and how we've managed to find a win-win in that fresh supply chain. So that's why I find the, the topic a little bit misleading. Don't rate us down when you're rating us at the end of this. But you don't always need to make a trade-off between profit and planet. And we've done some really good work with Shep in that space, which Debbie will take you through. But what it really is, is about saying, how, how do you try and balance the priorities that exist in the supply chain? Typically, anything around going green has a negative price tag attached. And while that is true in a lot of instances, it doesn't have to be true all the time. So today I'm going to take you through an example in our supply chain where we've managed to do both and how we've managed to make that work. Before I go into it, you know, I think it's important to say, well, why fresh? And why, why do we think this is so important? So for us, and we've done a lot of work in terms of testing this, a fresh product in terms of poultry and in terms of protein in general, uh, the best product is a fresh product. So when you freeze protein and then you, you thaw it, the quality goes down and we don't believe in that. We believe in giving our customers the best possible quality product, which is why we go to great pains to make sure that our chicken is fresh. The other thing is, and this is completely secondary, but a fresh product is actually a lot easier to deal with from an operational complexity perspective. So if you have a frozen product, it actually takes 48 hours for us to defrost that correctly. That's a lot more than you do at home, but we don't cut many corners on that, and that's to get to the best quality product. And that means that you need to know today what you're gonna sell in two days time. And if you get it wrong, you have no recourse. So it works with a number of other chains. We prefer fresh, it makes it easier for our restaurants. So 
We are the only chain in South Africa that does national fresh protein. So any other chain where you get a chicken or a piece of meat, either it's frozen or it's not a national solution. Okay, and it's taken quite a lot of effort to make that work. So if you look at our network and how it works, we have chicken suppliers all over the country, three or four of them at present, and what happens is they move that product into Vector and Vector distributes it to our network. So practically what happens is we tell our poultry producers today we need so many chickens today or tomorrow morning. They deliver it either this evening or tomorrow morning. It gets picked, loaded on Vector vehicles and it goes out the next day. So, you, you know, the, the challenge around fresh is that you only have seven to ten days from the time it's produced to when it goes off, okay, when it has to be consumed. So you don't have a lot of leeway, you, you don't have safety stock, you don't have a lot to work with. It has to come into your network and go out almost immediately. Otherwise, you don't have enough time in store to use that product before, before you run out of, of shelf life. Now, in that, we had a challenge and an opportunity. So, we used to put our product in cartons, so you'd have a certain number of chickens in a, in a paper carton, and that would go to our stores. Now, that wasn't great for a number of reasons. One, it was the pure operational complexities of that. So, one, if, if, a, if the carton became wet, you would lose structural integrity, and then you'd have issues like pallets falling over and issues in the back of house or handling. So it wasn't great. And remember, our chicken comes marinated from the factory. So you've got, you've got quite a lot of moisture that could potentially seep into the product if, if you have any sort of leakage. The other thing that you have to remember is if you have a frozen product, the water freezes, you don't have these issues. But with fresh, you do. So one, it was a problem from an operational perspective. The second thing is that that carton actually cost quite a lot of money. So a chicken is a heavy product. When you put 12 of them in a carton, the carton needs to take a certain amount of weight to it to be able to, to retain its structural integrity, which means a certain amount of, of paper, which means a certain amount of cost. So it wasn't a great solution from that perspective. The third was the environmental impact, which is quite significant. So Actually, making this change took out almost 100 tons of, of paper from our supply chain every month. So we used quite a lot of cardboard, and you also had to dispose of the cardboard. So I don't know if you've gone to the back of any sort of QSR restaurant that has a lot of cardboard, but you'll find this big stack sitting next to the dumpster that has to be disposed of. So it's not great. And then it also goes to our purpose. So at Nando's, we have a purpose that says that not making money, that happens anyway, but we want to positively change the lives of people. And this linked in with that overall purpose that we have. So there were a number of reasons why we, we wanted to do this. And what happened was, Shep was already talking to, to our 3PL about opportunities in that space, we found out about it, we got involved, and we looked at how do we then take all that cardboard out of our supply chain and put in something that is reusable, is better operationally, and is more sustainable for the environment. And that's when you know the solution came along. And I'll leave it to Debbie to talk about that for a little bit. Um, just a little bit about myself. So I'm director of retail for CHEP South Africa. Uh, under the retail banner uh, falls uh, quick service restaurants, as obviously uh, the retailers and the wholesale sector as well. So I'm just going to start off with a short video um, which shows a little bit about the cheap branding. So I'll leave you with this for now. What makes the world move? What makes it move forward instead of backward? Economic growth? International trade? The ability to feed itself? What moves the world to trade sustainably? What moves it to prosper now and tomorrow? What moves a business to serve the world? What moves it to serve all people? When it believes it must? When it knows it can? 
when profit and planet are no longer a compromise? This is the dream of the modern supply chain. To gain greater efficiencies, to eliminate waste, to share more resources, to create a better future for business, the planet, and everyone. So just to give you a little bit of background about Brambles, uh, Brambles is a supply chain logistics company operating through the CHIP and IFCO brands. Um, I think most of you in this room would be familiar with CHIP, which is really around pallets and containers, and IFCO is our, um, our sister company on crates, which operates in North America and Europe. In South Africa, CHIP looks after pallets, crates and containers, all under the one brand, really due to the, to the size of the industry. Um, in terms of our global structure, Brambles employs 14,500 people um, across the globe. With 850, we operate in 850 service centres. We have 550 million pallets, crates and containers in use around the world and we operate in 60 countries. So really um, the biggest regions would be North America and Europe from a Brambles perspective. So Brambles adds value by providing reusable platforms uh, to multiple partners or participants in the supply chain, um, which is commonly known as pooling, as you probably are, are aware of it. So that's really what we've done in terms of this Nando's project, is, op is introduced a, a reusable platform shared by multiple participants, and that's where the value comes in. So a little bit of background about the Nando's project. Um, it really started, as Ellie mentioned, when we were doing some work with Vector, which is Nando's 3PL, um, more around the pallet um, side of the supply chain. And uh, we recognized at that particular point that there was perhaps some other value that we could add within the supply chain. So we started off by doing a value chain analysis, which is really unpacking the whole supply chain from end to end, um, understanding what works in the supply chain and where there are probably some inefficiencies that could be taken out of the supply chain. Um, it was quite clear after we had finished the value chain analysis and presented it, that uh, there were clear opportunities to move from a carton box to a crate. So uh, in terms of some of the challenges that we faced, uh, it certainly wasn't an easy project. Um, I think that uh, some of the difficulties we faced was around the change management. So some of these projects are quite simple. You have a customer and you have a supplier. In this instance, we had uh, Nando's, we had the 3PL Vector, we had the chicken producers as well as CHIP. So there were multiple parties to try and get, aboard, get on board, get aligned in terms of the vision, the purpose, the benefits, um, and to get them across the line when they saw the change from cartons to, to crates, which changed their processes um, throughout every party in the supply chain. Uh, the second challenge was the platform itself. So it's great to say we're moving from a, uh, a, a carton to a crate. Well, what kind of crate? I think we went through about 25 different samples before we settled on our current uh, chip pooling crate at the end of it, which was a little challenge. Um, and the thought behind that was just the, in terms of the, the price point, um, as well as the fact that that's our model, is introducing a reusable platform throughout multiple parties, didn't make sense to introduce another crate into the supply chain. Um, the third piece that was a little difficult was the implementation. So it was quite a long rollout, it took about 12 months to fully implement the project. Um, we started off on a regional basis, so um, in a smaller region KZN first, and the thinking behind that was to, to go small, fix up the problems, and then roll it out to the next region, and to leave Gauteng, which was the biggest region, until last, and by that stage we would have ironed out all the problems, which proved to be true. Uh, the other approach would have been a big bang approach, but the risk to the business is slightly more. So, um, in terms of uh, the benefits out of this, I think Eddie's mentioned there's, there's a number of benefits. So the first one is hard cost savings. So just looking at the total packaging cost, there's an overall saving. And that really came about not comparing the cost of a, a carton to the cost of the crate, but more about how much chicken you could fit into a crate compared to a carton. So it was about a 30% increase of the amount of chicken you can put into a crate, which meant you could more, get more chickens on a pallet, which means your truck utilization was greater as well. So the per pallet 
um, utilization increased by about 60%, which is quite a, sig a significant amount. Um, the second uh, bit is your soft cost savings. So um, if you saw uh, the difficulty that, was, uh, that, that the stores faced at the back door when it came to cartons and came to removal of the cartons from a recycling perspective, it, it, you know, it was a little messy, a little untidy. By introducing the foldable crate, suddenly you had this neat area in the back door and you didn't have to worry about the stores getting rid of, um, getting rid of cardboard for recycling. Uh, there was also a benefit from a temperature control perspective, so um, the crates are designed so that the air flows freely through the crates, so that had an added advantage in terms of product quality. And the third piece was really around the structural integrity of the crate and being able to stack the crates on top of one another without getting product damages, so that had quite a significant impact in the project as well. Um, the third piece is around environmental benefits, so I think Ellie touched on it, is that Yes, there's big savings in terms of the hard cost savings, the soft cost savings. But what about the environmental impact of the supply chain? Because it's no good introducing a solution and then we have a significant negative impact on the environment. So in terms of CHIP, our intrinsic values really work around better communication, better business, and better planet. And that's really what this project is all about. Um, we're now in a fortunate position that we have a life cycle analysis calculator which can calculate the impact of moving from a carton to a, a crate, whether it be a rigid crate or a foldable crate, in this case it was a foldable crate, and what is the impact of this. So it's, I think it's an important, um, important piece to measure that you can actually back up the sustainable benefits by actually having some hard numbers to, to verify them. So in terms of the, the benefits, um, we can calculate the CO2 reductions, we can calculate the um, water uh, reduction in terms of water usage, as well as the uh, waste to landfill benefits. Um, so with regards to CO2 reductions, we saw a 60% reduction in CO2, uh, which is equivalent of about 100 cars removed off the road in a year. Um, in terms of water reduction, uh, we saw probably about a 60% reduction in water, redu water usage as well, which if I can relate it to something more practical, uh, Cape Town's got a water restriction of about 100 litres uh, per day per person. This solution would be able to provide about 20,000 households water if you take, take a look at the savings. And then the third bit is around uh, waste to landfall, so that's a fairly big number. Um, there was about an 85% reduction in the waste to landfill through, uh, because of the project, um, which is equivalent about, of about 450,000 household waste, which is about the size of Port Elizabeth. So some big numbers coming out there from, a, from an environmental benefit perspective. I'm going to um, close off with just a short video which takes you through, shows you the solution end to end, and then I'm going to hand over to Ellie to conclude the presentation. CHIP is a supply chain solutions company and we facilitate the world's ability to trade efficiently and sustainably by optimizing the flow of goods through the supply chain. I'm Chris Virasamy, I'm the project manager for the Nando's rollout nationally. So when crates get returned from the trade, uh, CHIP does an inspection process and to make sure that the crates are functionally operational. We also do a washing and cleaning process to make sure that we adhere to the food safety regulations or health and hygiene uh, regulations. So once Crates are issued from a CHIP facility, either CHIP delivers or the customer collects. When crates arrive at a poultry farm, uh, they're unpacked, erected and processed chicken are then packed into the crates. So some of the benefits of uh, using the CHIP foldable crates is, one, you need less space to store uh, empty crates as opposed to, to boxes. Uh, you probably need less people because you don't have to erect boxes anymore. The crate erecting is a much faster, simpler, cleaner process. Uh, there's definitely reduced damages because previously in transit boxes used to collapse uh, which were the, the more rigid crates prevents that from happening now in the supply chain. Vector Logistics then do the distribution of those crates down to a Nando's back door where it's unpacked and put into the cold rooms or chillers. My name is Nivesh Gavanda and I'm the Senior Logistics Specialist at Nando Central Kitchen. On the, on the receiving side, the, the, the biggest benefit is the, of the crates. It's easy to stack, it's durable. Um, when it's empty, it, it collapses and the guys store it with, with ease and then the environmental impact that we've, um, the positive environmental impact that we've 
uh, introduced with the removal of the cotton. So from the system we've received quite a positive feedback regarding the crates and, and it's much more easier through the receiving side. solution work? So the idea is basically, and they spoke about it a bit in the video, your, your crate will go to your chicken supplier. Your chicken supplier will put your chicken in the crate. Your, ch your chicken supplier will then supply it into Vector Logistics, who will then supply it into our stores. The crate, once the chicken has been consumed, will go back to Vector, who will send it back to Shed. It sounds relatively simple, but it's actually quite a complex thing because that crate, which is a physical asset, changes ownership six times in that process. And each time the ownership changes, you need to record that and move that. And I'll talk about some of the changes about that a little bit later. But what's important to note in all of this is the model was premised on moving that crate through the supply chain in a certain number of days. So if you, you think about Chef as a, as a commercial entity, they have an asset, they rent that asset out, they make money off the rental of that asset. It's important to them that it moves through quickly enough that they get a return on that asset. Which is important because in terms of how we set up the model, we charge a fixed rate which I believe was quite new for Shep at the time as well. So it's a different model and we've made it work. It's not been the easiest thing in the world, but it, it has had the desired effect and we've seen the benefits. In terms of some of the key challenges, the first one and probably the most important one is maintaining that cycle time. So you have an instance where you now have an asset that needs to move through in a certain amount of time. It goes through four different stakeholders and only one of them, or two of them, you can say Nando's head office and share, actually care about how long it takes. So if you think about the chicken supplier, all the chicken supplier cares about is making sure that they have a crate to put chicken in. They don't care if they have 100,000 crates sitting there. What's important is when they need a crate, they have one. At the same time, the, the stores who, who take the crate use the contents and then send it back, aren't really penalized. So we, we put a, quite a lot of effort in on a monthly basis to make sure that we do get that cycle rate under control and we find ways to make, make it better. The other one was just a practical solution. So the crates themselves, um, for handling purposes and movement, you need a cable tie. So we had to invest in cable ties. They're the biggest cable ties you've ever seen, about a meter long. And uh, they, they stack 10 crates, or they, they lock 10 crates together at a time, making it easier to move through the supply chain. And probably the biggest one for us has been the administrative burden. So because you now have an asset that you have to record in and out, that you have to count, throughout our chain has created quite a lot of additional admin, which we've happily taken on board, given the benefits that we've seen. So remember, we're seeing operational benefits, so even though the stores have this admin challenge, that they also have an easier time of it actually moving product. And at the same time, you know, if you look at the investment that we have to make of people, it's been offset by the positive commercial and environmental benefits. So we've taken on board happily, but they're still there. And it's something to remember if you want to do it in your businesses. So when do crates make sense? For us it made sense because we had a product that moves very quickly through our value chain. It had a product that was quite heavy, quite high value, and it was a product that could be packed in the crate. So if I break that down, the first thing that you need if you're going to use a crate or any sort of reusable storage device is you need to make sure that the commercials make sense in terms of the cycle time that it moves through your network. So we've looked at this for other products, like chips, and it hasn't worked because you have two weeks of, of, of safety stock at your supplier, you have two weeks of safety stock at Vector, and you still have safety stock at the back of the house. So for a crate to cycle through in that instance, it just takes too long to make economic sense. 
Right? So that's the first thing you need. The second one is you need a product that actually fits in the crate. So we've looked at bread rolls as well. And because the product is so low value, and because it takes up so much space, it doesn't make sense. And the third one is you need a product that can actually get in there through your manufacturing process. So it makes sense if you have a product that moves quickly through your network. If you, you're moving products through the manufacturing stages and it's only there for a day or two, it can make sense. But you need the right product with the right cycle time in order for it to make sense for your business. In terms of where we're going next, both for crates and just in general, so we're looking actively at technology in the nano supply chain and with crates specifically to see how we can get better value. So I've noticed over the last two days, and I'm sure you have, data and all of these sorts of things has been a big topic. It's important in our world. We also want to look to, to try and automate some of the administration around this solution to try and reduce that burden, so that's something we're looking at actively. We're looking at efficiencies both with SHIP and without. So yesterday I was in a panel talking about 3PLs. One of the things we're looking at with our 3PL is how do we do value engineering? How do we find ways to, to create efficiencies in their business or the Nando's business that we can both benefit from? And lastly, we always look to get more products and create. So this has worked for us. We already have the admin burden that we have now. So if you put more products in crates, everything's been set up, we have, a, we have the infrastructure, so you're just seeing additional benefit. And what I'd like to leave you with, for those of you that are not chef, and I see quite a few chef people in, in, in the building, but it's just a question to say, what can you do in your business? At Nando's, we were able to find a win-win solution. We found something that saved us money, or was at least cost neutral that saw an efficiency benefit for our business and was better on the environment. You know, it proves that it doesn't have to be a trade-off. You don't have to pick the planet over profit. Although in some instances you may want to. The question I have for you guys is what can you do in your business? How can you find those win-wins? Or at the very least find something that maybe it's not a complete win-win, but your net benefit is higher than, than the effort that you have to put in. And that's it from us. Any questions?